Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Productivity Mastery Podcast. My name is Toyon and I'm super, super excited to have a, one of the uh, most amazing people that I've been following actually for years. Uh, his name is Shane Herbert and he's a prolific, a very prolific DOP, Director of Photography uh, from Hollywood, having shot a number of exceptional productions, iconic pictures such as Need for Speed, Terminator, Salvation, and many, many more movies. Before I give him the world the, to introduce himself properly, I would like to, uh, to share with you a video so you can get a sense of some of the things that Shane is actually doing. I've been shooting for about 25 years. Those years of experience really educate you on what lights do well, what they don't do, and all the different applications. How many times I've lit bedrooms, day exteriors, day interiors, night exteriors. I'm still trying new things to understand why this light is better. How can I utilize it? How can I take the creative story even higher? This is the kind of boots on the ground training, and we're going to be sharing those kind of pearls of wisdom with you. Think of it as me giving you the keys to my castle. Wow, what an opener, Stoyan. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on this show. I'm so looking forward to it. My wife, Lydia, said it was absolutely amazing when she was on so i was like hey let me let me get a piece of story on uh let's let's get this thing going let's do it let's do it shane how how are you this morning where are you i am fantastic absolutely fantastic uh had an incredible day yesterday i i you know uh my mom moved in with us during the pandemic uh and so did my father-in-law so we have a packed house. We have seven people currently living in our home. Uh, and um, yesterday was going to the bank and I took my mom out to lunch. And then we had, uh, we went grocery shopping together. We, uh, I used to be her sous chef when she was, uh, she was a sixth grade school teacher and a, uh, and a caterer. So I, I was her sous chef growing up. So we always love going to the store together and picking all the ingredients and vegetables and everything. So it's a very fun experience for both of us. That is amazing. We have the first pair of hearts being sent to us from Ann Patterson. And thank you for watching. Thank you for being with us. Shane, um, many people listening right now, they're coming from the, the world of entrepreneurship, business, and they might be wondering, this guy is a director of photography. What does that even mean? So could you maybe give us a bit of, a, of an idea? What do you actually do as a director of photography? Yeah, so uh, director of photography directs all the photography on the film uh, or the commercial or music video. So that has a lot to do with, you know, taking the emotion of the characters and of the script and uh, being able to assist in that process of how I'm lighting a scene is based on the emotion of the scene, how I, how the camera moves, uh, what it feels like. Is it, is it uh, you know, uh, handheld so it feels uneasy? Is it very stoic and locked off? Is it very fluid? All these are based Everything is based on emotion. So as a director of photography, I take the script as my Bible and uh, those emotions I'm uh, taking and deconstructing and turning them into what the lighting and mood and tone is going to feel like in every scene, as well as what the camera emotion is going to be uh, as well. And that's you know deciding which camera we shoot with, which lenses, the soul of the movie, uh, we use uh, what the lighting instruments is it going to be something that's hard contrast is it going to be very colorful is it going to be more desaturated all these tones figuring out a lookbook and color blocking and design and schematics and blocking schematics and shot listing this is all 
uh, part of the director of photography's job. And let's as, as well as running a team uh, that can be as small as 10 people to uh, like on Terminator Salvation, I had 295 camera grip and electric uh, technicians all working alongside me uh, on that film. So, you know, it's a big leadership as well and trying to organize and, and uh, you know, set the team up for success uh, the best as possible. I think for people who are not in the movie business, uh, they might get surprised how many people actually behind a production just in the yes. department that you're running. But I, I want to go back in time and, and, and hear more about uh, your beginnings and, and how did you get excited to start being a director of photography as I understand you actually have been trying a lot of different things, including being a musician, uh, DJing and so on and so forth. So could you share with us the beginnings of the story and what brought you to where you are today? Yeah, sure. So um, when I was in high school, I was a jock. Okay. I played every sport possible. I played golf, tennis, soccer, uh, basketball, baseball, football, you name it, I played it. Uh, and that was my whole thing. And soccer was something that I was very good at. Uh, I played semi-pro for uh, a, a couple of years. Um, you know, so I, I really loved uh, sports. But when I was in, I think, uh, my senior year, I was the person that did the morning announcements. So I, uh, every morning I would uh, get on the, the, the mic and uh, talk to everyone that was at our school. And I tried to make it very fun. Uh, you know, I was like, and the weather today. And I would look out the window, it's snowing. Or, you know, it was, it was not any matter of fact. I didn't get any current events or anything. I just made it all up. And people really liked the humor in it all of starting their day off with, with me in the morning announcements. So somebody said, and I loved music. Uh, I wasn't really good. I, I played drums in, and I was in chorus, uh, all state chorus. Uh, so I, I had a, I loved singing and uh, I, drums, I didn't really pick up. I, I didn't gravitate towards it. I was more focused on, on sports. Uh, but I loved music and I loved Elton John and Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and, uh, you know, coming up, um, with that as a foundation, I, everyone said, well, you got a great voice, you know, why don't you be a DJ? So then I started, uh, I bought all these speakers and turntables and I started DJing all at all the different high schools all around the area. And then somebody said, well, that's something you could really do. Why don't you be a DJ on a radio station? So I'm like, all right. So I went into my guidance counselor and I said, okay, what uh, area, what schools have radio and television, you know, programs? And, you know, I was, we didn't grow up with a lot of money. Um, we were in a very kind of lower middle class area of upstate New York farming community. So my parents uh, had saved to uh, money to put me through college and they didn't want me to have to pay all the student loans and everything. So I said, okay, let me go to a small junior college, like a community college to make sure this is what I want to do. Uh, so it was very minimal as like, you know, under $3,000 for the whole year uh, back then and uh, with housing and everything. So it was very, very uh, cheap. And I really started to fall in love with radio. And then the next year was television and I fell in love with television. And then that year that I graduated, I ended up getting a full ride scholarship because I was number one in my class. So I got a scholarship to go wherever I wanted. And there was no other place that I was going than following where my wife was was my future wife was going and she was going to Boston. So I remember going in to my guidance counselor at, uh, at my community college, Herkimer community college in upstate New York. And I said, just get me into the best film school in Boston. I am chasing my future wife. 
And they're like, uh, well, that's not the greatest reason to picking a school, you know, and I, I don't care. I'm going there. So they're like, well, there's this place called Emerson College. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to Emerson. So we were able to use the scholarship to pay for 90% of it. Uh, and that summer that I came back after graduating from community college, my friend uh, was going to USC and he came back and he was doing a uh, practicum film. So his, his final uh, film project. And I asked him, could I work on it? And he said, sure. And I started, you know, getting into the lighting, getting into the grip, getting into camera and really loving that. So when I get, went to Emerson, I had already signed up for mass communication. So when I came in that fall, I did a double major. I did mass com and film at the same time. So I was taking like something radical, like 28 credit hours per semester uh, to be able to do both at the same time. And then eventually I just let mass communication uh, fall off and I just focused all on film. So the last two years, I, I focused on film, graduated from Emerson, thinking that I was, you know, and I didn't like lighting at all. I thought uh, director of photography, that is boring. You know, I, I didn't want any of that stuff. I, I, I thought I was going to be a producer. I was really good with money. I was really good with, and I could convince anybody to do anything. So I'm like, that's a producer. So I, you know, my mom bought me a three-piece suit and I got out on the street and, you know, started walking in Boston. And I'm like, hey, t -t 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 I'm Shane Hurlman and I just graduated from Emerson and I like to be a producer. Doosh! You know, it's like every door was just slammed in my face. And I'm like, what is this suit? Is it the suit that mom bought? <laughs> but I was like, okay, uh, this isn't working. So then I went back to the internship that I had, which is what is that a rental house that did lighting, grip and camera. So I went back there, got a job at $3.50 an hour and just started packing trucks. And within three months, I was running the whole uh, grip, lighting, and camera rental division, as well as going out uh, as a driver. So growing up on the farm, I drove 40-foot trucks, 10-ton trucks, grain trucks, all that stuff as a kid. So, you know, hopping on a tractor trailer and driving around was no big deal. So that was kind of my start in the business is I started out in Boston realized that the only way I was going to move up in Boston was if the person that was above me died, okay? Because that was way it worked there. It was all seniority. So I was the little young whippersnapper with all this energy. And I was like, I'm going to be a gaffer, you know? And they're like, no, no, you're not. When you're about 50, you'll be a gaffer. And I was like, Lydia, my fiance at the time, I said, let's head out to Los Angeles where we can make it our own. And so then we moved out to Los Angeles. I started right back at the bottom again, $5 an hour, who a dollar 50, uh, you know, uh, salary bump, uh, packing grip trucks once again in Los Angeles. And, uh, within three months, just like clockwork, um, I got offered a, a movie to drive a grip truck. And they told me I had to leave uh, the uh, rental house. And the way it went down was the marketing guy and the producer were having a meeting up in the office. And uh, you could view down on the second story, you could look at the parking lot. And I was, you know, because I was in, big into sports, I didn't understand this whole thing that the union says, don't run. I ran everywhere. I ran to get this, ran to get that, ran back to get this, ran back. And the guy's like, who is that person that's running all over the parking lot? And they go, oh, this is this new guy, this new kid from Boston. He's got so much energy. Uh, he's, he's just crazy with it. And he goes, and Roberto, the... Uh, the producer goes, can I have him as my grip truck driver? And they're like, really? And I'm in there. He's like, yeah. So sure enough, they talked to me. They And then they ended up going with a different company. 
So they said, Shane, will you leave the rental house and become our driver? And that was a huge, this was a turning point. These are how these uh, moments in your career where you could go, you know, this way or that way. And I said, okay, uh, you know, Lydia was working at Children's Hospital. She had a full ride for us to move out and they paid for all of her expenses and all that stuff as a, as a nurse at Children's. So I'm like, all right, let's see where this takes us. I could completely fall flat on my face and thus not work out. Uh, so I, I gave up my job and I moved on to this production. It was like a B horror film called Phantasm 2 this summer the ball is back. Right. And, uh, it was like this, these Martians that, that ran a crematorium, uh, cemetery and they had these, you know, balls that were like a mirror ball and they had forks and it stuck into people's heads. And then a drill came out and drilled out their brains. So this was kind of how I got started. And, and, uh, you know, so many cool things came out of that. Like, the the effects team that was firing these uh plastic balls down the hallway so they'd fly by camera they came up with this spring-loaded thing on piano wire and they'd fire it and the damn thing would go like this like 10 feet down and just wouldn't go anywhere and i go you know i was a college uh pitcher if you want it to go around the corner to the right well that's a rising fastball if you want to go around this corner well that's a curveball so I just started chucking the balls down the, the hallway, and that is what is in the movie, is all these balls that are going and flying by the lens are me as a you know 23-year-old, 24-year-old guy just chucking these plastic balls. And sometimes my rising fastball, I was never too accurate with that damn thing. So, you know, it would come off my hand wrong and just shatter up into the ceiling. And they're like, those balls are $150 a piece, you know? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but what ended up happening was one of the, um, the best boy electric was a USC cinematography grad. OK, and I get called on the radio and they say, hey, Shane, uh, this is Terry Key Grip. He goes, hey, run an 18 by 24 flag into the crematorium set. I'm like, I'm on it. So I come in and I'm walking down the stairs and Brian Coyne, who's the the uh, cinematography USC grad, is stops me on the stairs and he goes, Shane, look at the light. Would you be scared? And I go, what, what are you talking about, Brian? He goes, look, the director of photography has lit every nook and cranny. There's no shadow. And it was like, pang. From that point on, everything I looked at was light. I, it finally clicked in my mind. And then I went from a grip truck driver in 1988 to shooting Nirvana, Come As You Are, in 1991. So a, a rapid uh, rise uh, as a director of photography. And then, you know, I was off to the races. I started doing all the grunge era rock and roll. Uh, and then uh, I got my first, um, you know, feature, the Rat Pack, based on a music video that I shot for the film Daylight. It was with Donna Summer and Bruce Roberts. And uh, Rob Cohen, who, the, who was the director of Daylight, sent his producing team down to check out how the music video was going. And they came back to him. And they said, you got it. This thing was unbelievable. This director of photography, I've never seen anyone who commands a set like this guy. You got to check him out. And sure enough, a week later, I got a call. I went in, interviewed and uh, got the Rat Pack. And that's kind of was the start of my narrative career. Right. And from there on, you've been involved in many feature film productions you've been running your academy for filmmaking which we're going to talk about later on as well shooting commercials and all kind of things like that i'm curious to hear though what was the inner shift the mind shift you said you're coming from this farming community how did you start dreaming and having these ambitions about making it as a filmmaker like for many people from the small you know, places like villages and towns, it's, it's hard for them to see 
the role model? How, how did you shift and started to dream and to believe and that you can actually achieve a lot and succeed? I think a lot of that is your upbringing. You know, it's like my parents were so good with letting me just kind of decide what I wanted to do. They didn't force me down any roads. I mean, my dad was a professor's assistant at Cornell. I had a full ride at Cornell, absolutely free, four years if I wanted to take it. And I didn't. And uh, there was no pressure or animosity from my parents. They just wanted me to be great at whatever I chose. And they really, uh, that that base and foundation was very early on. Um, you know, both of them were teachers in their own right. You know, my mom was a sixth grade teacher. My dad was a professor's assistant. So he would take all the grad students uh, on the farm where they're doing all their experiments. And he you know, really took them through the process of what it means to, you know, plant and harvest and and till and all this stuff. He was uh, in agronomy, so the science of of plants and and uh, you know making hybrids uh, for sweet corn and soybeans and all this stuff. So, you know that I think that was really the the ability that I could dream and whatever I loved and, and was my passion, they were all on board for it. They, they didn't, I hear so many parents saying, okay, you can go to school, but you can't go far away from home. Uh, you know, you can go to school, but I want you to be a lawyer. You can go to school, but I want you to be a doctor. That was not my upbringing. You can go to school and be whatever you want was my upbringing. So I just tried everything. And, you know, I started out as a grip truck driver and then I became a dolly grip and I learned how to move the camera and, the, and I made all the mistakes and, you know, didn't remember when to boom up correctly or forgot to charge the dolly and the director of photography, the operator's looking at me, what are you dumb? You know, it's like, come on, dude, you got to be on it, you know, and I'm trying to figure out my way. And then I became a key grip because a lot of the, the upbringing on the farm is, is a lot about rigging and, you know, uh, doing a lot of stuff um, that is very uh, common sense based uh, in regards to, you know, planning stuff out. And then I learned to be uh, a best boy electric and learned how to distribute power and how to balance it and all that. And then a gaffer, and then a director of photography. So I really went up the technical side and then I did a little camera assisting as well because I wanted to learn more about that. So I learned how to load cameras. I learned how to, you know, what it took to pull focus, understand measurement, uh, just be organized in, in general as, as a lot of the etiquette of what a camera assistant does. So, you know, I just tried everything. And then all of a sudden, that moment on Phantasm 2 was when it all clicked and I just saw this was going to be my future. And I just, you know, I, I think about how quickly it happened, but you got to understand it wasn't kind of quick because one year I did 102 music videos in one year. So imagine that it's like most people work, you know, 200 days out of the year, 180 days out of the year, let's say, but I was working like almost 320 days out of the year. And so, and, and all different varying projects. So I got a huge breadth of working for different director of photographies and, and uh, them being my mentors and kind of shaping who I was uh, as, as an artist. This is this is impressive, and I think your story, Shane, is like a movie story, like literally, like you know, going after the girlfriend. Uh, oh yeah, you know, no, I know. <laughs> it's like it's it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a film, definitely. You know, it's it's it was so funny because it didn't matter whether the school was shit or not. I was going to Boston. I, I was just chasing her. I knew. I walked in on our first date, and now you got to understand, Lydia and I have been knew each other since we were three years old, okay? In this small little farming community, her dad was the minister of the area. So he uh, and my great-grandmother was bedridden. She couldn't get out of bed and everything. So he brought communion every Sunday to our home. Uh, and 
Lydia would come with her dad and then we'd play in the, you know, family room while he was giving her communion. And then, you know, he would grab her and, and, uh, take off. So when we started dating in 10th grade, um, you know, I, our first date, we went to McDonald's, right? And, uh, you know, that was my big spending spree. Uh, and after that date, I, I sat on the steps with my mom and I said, you know, mom, I just met the woman I'm going to marry. And she's like, dude, she's like, there's no way. There's all these fish in the sea. You're not going to marry the person that you grew up in this small little town with. You're going off to college and you're going to see so many more people and and travel the world. Uh, and I go, no, she's the one. And uh, I just made it my mission to whenever th her family threw roadblocks in the way, I just drove a tank through them. Uh, and I was there was nothing that was going to stop me uh, from you know, having Lydia as my wife. I just knew that she was the one. I think this is a, this is an amazing lesson for everybody. Having clarity what you're after and really going after it. And what I want to dig into, since this is productivity mastery, and I think you have a lot of lessons to share is, um, you mentioned the word planning and you, you also said that you, you had a good capacity to be a successful producer what do you do? How do you set priorities? How do you make sure that you plan things effectively? Could you share some lessons and maybe just to give a little bit more of a nuance um, on a big feature film production? How do you, with all these responsibilities, all the tasks that you have as, as a director of photography, how do you set priorities and make sure that you stay on focus? Yeah, I mean, I think over the years I have come up with a and it's taken a it takes a long time to master making movies. Uh you know, it's everyone thinks okay, well you just show up and you're going to shoot the scene and everything. There's so much that goes into it with production design and you know, the way the camera feels, the way the lighting feels, hair, makeup, wardrobe, VFX, special effects. There's so many people that have a creative expression in the movie. And so your job, your most difficult job as a director and as a director of photography is communicating the vision because you have so many creatives and you got to get everyone making one movie instead of everyone making their own movies. And that's what I have, you know, finally mastered is being able to come up with communication styles and documents that do not put people in silos, but bring people together and work on one united document that then educates every single department. And that used to be the script. And the script, to, to some extent, does that. But there's so many ways that you can interpret a script. Uh, and you can interpret the emotion. So the emotion needs to be interpreted from the director. And that has to all, so what's the director interprets that emotion to myself and the production designer. Then now it's my job to start taking every department and kind of communicate that division, uh, uh, you know, communicating the vision. And I've seen it done so many ways. There's storyboards, obviously, that are very uh, descriptive and they show you exactly what the frame is going to be. You can see how many shots are in a scene. You can break down a movie very efficiently with that. But storyboards can also be a very much of a moving target. Uh, you know, the storyboards are conceptualized by the director and myself. And then, you know, they're not really, you know, because you're doing it, quote unquote, in a vacuum. So, you know, it's not uh, design per the location. Uh, so a lot of the physicalities, the location are not going to enable us to get the angles and the shots that are in the storyboard. So that's why I take the approach of storyboards are the last thing that I'm uh, involved in. I want to be able to come up with the shot list and the blocking. Uh, and then that educates what the story uh, storyboards are. And you really can't shot list and block until you have locations, uh, until you know what those schematics are of a set. So, 
you know, you can't put the cart before the horse, let's say. So very much is, you know, getting in uh, my first day of prep is just being in a van for, you know, 10 hours going from location to location of all the stuff that the director and the production designer has worked on prior to me getting there or uh, what's been happening on during COVID is we all start together, which I think is the best way to do a movie anyway. And uh, so many studios have veered off this path where, you know, they start the director of photography only like eight weeks or six weeks before production. And I all I do for those six weeks is play catch up. Uh, so the last three films that I did in COVID, we did together. Uh, so the production designer, uh, the producer, myself, the director, we all start together. Uh, so we're all looking at locations together and we're planning it all out and we're hearing, you know, my thoughts on it before, uh, the producer and the production designer and the director already say, Oh, I love this location. And I'm like, yeah, it is a great location, but we're on the 20th floor and it's going to be really difficult to keep this light consistent up here. Can we see how we can, you know, maybe make a compromise or, you know, or the lighting change or, you know, so it's like these type of things, usually are baked in and I have no way of changing it. Uh, and, and you only hope that the producer and the, or the production designer and the director um, really knock it out for you. So they lead a line up a, you to have success. Uh, Fathers and daughters was a perfect example. I got brought in only four weeks, uh, you know, before production started the production designer and the director had already locked in all the locations and luckily every single one of them were was amazing and worked for me lighting wise and and all that stuff but that is very few and far between uh so and it all depends on the director's vision you know gabriel muccino uh does something very unique he embeds the shot list into the script so the script being usually 108 or 110 pages becomes 240 uh, and because every shot is embedded into the script, so it's a working document. So I said, okay, Gabriele, let's take this even further. If we're going to use the script and you're putting the shot list in, why don't I describe what the light is going to be in the room and the mood and the tone and the way the camera is going to feel and, and the, the color tone in the room? So then what I did is based on that document, then I would put the look in there. So now the script end up going up to 300 some odd pages because I would describe the light in every scene. So now the, the script becomes the most incredible communicative tool because now I'm describing what the light is gonna look like, what the color tone, what the mood is, what the camera is going to feel like, and then they have Gabrielli's shot list. So now, you can, as a director of photography, or sorry, as a production designer, you can say, okay, well, it doesn't look like he's looking this direction, so I don't have to dress that. Yeah, exactly, you don't. This is what we're doing. We're only doing this. So it's a, it's once you start to get this communication in where the script really becomes the, and then, with that script, I do blocking schematics and shot listing where you see the cameras move around and dance with the uh, with the actors, you know, and then you can design the lighting off of that blocking. Uh, and so it's it's really these documents that I've kind of created and then making the script be as much of the main communicative, uh, you know, that, that drives the communication to every department. Uh, that is, um, that's kind of been my new uh, mastering the prep uh, is really trying to come up with documents that like is a perfect example. When I did Love Hard up in Vancouver, this look document was sent out to all the departments and the hair and makeup or no, the wardrobe costume designer said, I've never gotten this from a director of photography. I know if you're going orange, I can go a color on a color tone. 
Uh, I know I can dress my actors in different colors based on what I know what the room is going to look like and the mood and the color tone. So it starts to, and then hair and makeup is able to pick up on that. And and uh, then, you know, VFX and production design because they can see the blocking and they can see that, oh, we aren't looking that way. We don't have to dress that or we don't even have to build that part of the set. Uh, and these are the things that have really started to hone in and with these 10 hour days and with COVID-19 restrictions and everything that we have to do to still try to make a movie in this pandemic environment, I found that without this amount of prep and design, you cannot pull off the ultimate vision. Uh, and that's where, you know, during COVID, I reinvented how I prep. And I tried it out on Love Hard for the first time coming out of the pandemic, and it just blew people's minds. So I knew I was on to something. And then on junior year, I completely continued to finesse it uh, to the point of just like everyone saying these aha moments of, oh my God, I've never walked on set so confident, so knowing exactly what we were going to do. My team had a roadmap. Uh, you think about it, um, I, and I use this example. Okay, so say you are you're you have a, a gaffer and a key grip, and then they have all their departments, and they have their pre rig the rigging teams as well. So they come in and rig locations ahead of time. So when we get in there, at least a lot of the stuff is either hung or cables run or whatever. So imagine you telling a uh, rigging gaffer and rigging key grip to go from Los Angeles, drive from Los Angeles to New York, and you give them no map. All you give them is a compass, okay? So how efficiently are they going to be able to get from Los Angeles to New York without a map? But if I give them a map, they're going to get there very efficiently. So what I started to do is, you know, on most of my movies, uh, the big scenes and big sets, I would do lighting schematics for. And I would always have issues with budget. I have not, you know, they're asking for a lot more man days for rigging. They're asking for larger crews. They're asking for uh, more of this, more of that. We don't have a chain. It's not in our budget. And I said, okay. This is not the greatest situation. I don't like having these conversations. So I'm like, what if I do a lighting schematic and a blocking schematic and a shot list for every scene in the movie? And how will that work? So this on this last movie, 142 lighting schematics, 272 blocking schematics, and a shot list based on 70 plus scenes in the movie was all built within the first four weeks of my prep. And once my team started, there was no conversation about man days. There was no budget problems other than, hey, I got to limit a little bit here and oh, we got to do, but all seamless, absolutely effortless is how that rolled out. And That's with that, plan. I was able to walk in every day. I had the team knew exactly. I mean, I got so granular with it, with gags. Okay, a light's going to be turning on in the room. So we need to make sure we have this, that, and the other thing. Oh, we're going to be using negative fill here. So make sure you're building a 12 by 20 and a 12. I mean, so granular that the team could literally build all this. And when I would walk in, we were almost lit. I would finesse it and we would go. And we would stay on the 10 hour days. And we would continue to have a, a very successful and healthy production. People didn't get COVID. We were able to go home after 10 hours and get the needed rest that we uh, that was required. Uh, we were able to have, you know, time off on the weekends. So we weren't, you know, moving the schedule where, like with most productions, if you started at 6 a.m., on a Monday, you were usually into 4 p.m. calls by Friday. Well, that never happened on a 10-hour day. You never had to push your calls. So everyone stayed in a very relaxed environment, and I felt it was the best movie experience that I've ever had. 
Uh, and it doesn't mean that Greatest Game wasn't an incredible experience. Uh, it was. But this is where I felt like I finally mastered the craft of prepping and being a director of photography. Let's stay here for a second, mastering the prep. What I find fascinating is you just described the level of detail, preparation, discipline. When you as a professional filmmaker, you are required to do, and you, you, you say that how important it is to, to master the prep. Isn't it interesting that many people, many of us do not do that in our own lives? Like, yes. Like, because Shane, we were joking about it, but you are the hero of your movie, right? You, you, are the, you are the person that's going to live this story. Why don't we use these tools? Why don't we, what is the story that you want to live? What is, what is the movie that you want? Like you're the producer, you're the director, you're the screenwriter, yet most people live by chance. They yes. don't do the prep. No. They don't know and, where they're going. First and, of all, they don't know where you're going. Exactly. And, you know, I've walked onto so many sets throughout my career like that. We don't know where we're going. And we figure it out on the day. Well, how successful and and uh, how's the productivity going to be on that? You're always in fight or flight, right? And that's not a great place to be because you overreact and, you know, tempers flare because everyone is in fight or flight. They're like, oh my God, we got to get this done in the time period. But holy shit, I just saw the scene for the first time. The actors are moving around. We never discussed it. We never blocked it. We never did anything. And then all of a sudden we, we do a little blocking rehearsal and then the director's like, let's shoot it. And I'm like, let's shoot it. My God, I haven't even lit the damn thing yet. So, you know, these are the things that, that um, I find that, yes, in, in our own life, we have to be very productive and to be productive you have to prep and you have to plan out your days and you know as an entrepreneur and this is what I am as a director of photography that's my day job but with the Hurlbut Academy soon to be the filmmakers academy this is something that you know you have to to plan out you have to really uh take all the stuff that I've been learning uh and and mastering at uh, the film level and you know, infuse that into the entrepreneurship. And trust me, I have, we have, have a, as a company made so many mistakes. Oh my God, we fail on a daily basis, but you know, that's what it's all about being an entrepreneur. It's, it's some things work, some things don't. And, you know, you just got to put your best foot forward and try to just communicate the vision to all the teams. So they have the roadmap. And one of the big things for us, our roadmap is our website. And, you know, last week, uh, I had my two creative directors and a lot of naysayers within our company, you know, thought that uh, we were not going to be able to pull this off with the timeline that Lydia and I set forth. So I did everything possible to set that up. So, you know, on September 2nd was our big day to launch the site to our team. For them to, you know, experience the UA, the user experience, you know, to go through the funnel and all that stuff. So I wanted to make sure everything was exactly how we wanted it, even though we still are a month out from launching or two months out. So it's like this whole thing. It's like I wanted them to see it in the best light. So hours and, and days of focusing and trying to upload things and get all the stuff done. So they saw it as that experience. And, you know, they walked away from it and like, wow, I see the roadmap. I know exactly where we're going. We are going to be able to do make these dates. We're going to be able to launch. And then all of a sudden my company got behind it completely, uh, you know, 180%. So, you know, these are the kind of things that, like you said, you know, we have to funnel this these techniques of of uniting a massive band of creatives on a movie and and putting them into this funnel so they're making one movie, which is the director's vision. Uh, 
you know, like I said, on many movies, there's 90 different movies being made. And only at the end, when you take the 90 different movies and put it in all together, that it comes up with something. And, and you're going to say, and you're going to feel, wow, that just doesn't feel designed. Well, it's not designed because there's 90 movies. But if you look at like uh, uh, an Edward Wright film, uh, a, a Coen Brothers film, that is designed every frame is discussed and worked out and the transitions and the whip pans and everything that needs to get you in is completely designed so it works as one entity uh so that's our our like i said our most uh difficult job is to creating that one environment that is one film i love it and shane you mentioned uh entrepreneurship and uncertainty, uh, which is kind of very similar to movie making. And I'm sure a lot of people are listening right now and they're like, this Shane guy, he's a rock star, man. You know, he's been <laughs> filming this uh, 102 music videos, Need for Speed, Terminator. He's crashing it, you know. He, he looks like a flawless guy. Could you tell me a little bit about the other side of the story? Um, failure, maybe? Maybe some, some of the, you know, a big fuck-up moments from like in a big production or and what do you do how do you deal with unexpected circumstances when something fucks up how, how do you mentally manage those kind of situations yeah i mean you know i think starting out in my career i was so young uh you know as a as a director of photography and i probably didn't have uh all of my leadership skills in the right place either uh you know i was i was in fight or flight coming up the ladder you know i was I, as i was moving up i was moving up very fast so my projects were exponentially getting bigger and the more responsibilities and the more responsibilities that fell on me sometimes i was not able to be the dam I was not able to be that dam and stop it. I let it roll down onto my whole crew and and uh, take it out on them. And that wasn't uh, the greatest leadership skills. And it's taken me a long time to be a good leader. And trust me, there's days when I fail horribly uh, at it. But the one thing I think I've I've found is is you got to stay. There's so many. Uh, people that fall into the grumpy kind of been doing this for a hundred years kind of mentality and they get jaded. Uh, I um, probably five or six years ago, I said to myself, you know, why am I angry? Why am I so grumpy about this, that, and the other thing? If we have to move on and I didn't get my shot uh, the way I wanted it, it's fine. We, we got to move on. It's all good, you know? Uh, so I finally started not letting my guard down or or not uh, or, or not wanting it to be perfect. But it's just like Bill Paxton told me, a movie is never finished. It's abandoned, right? You're so I really had to look at that as lighting wise and camera. It's like it's not like it's we're 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 settling for second best we're just moving on because we need to move on and it's like sometimes you have to lose the battle to win the war and i think that i you know my failures were me being a lot more responsibility put on me when i didn't necessarily have the maturity to handle it and uh, so my maturity level really was not so mature when I was making a lot of these decisions. And, you know, I look back at Terminator Salvation and what happened with the Christian Bale uh, scenario, and that was probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Uh, and people are saying, what? And I'm like, because it made me reevaluate my career and where I wanted to be because I was on this trajectory to, uh, you know, just do these huge monstrous blockbusters films back to back to back. And that kind of took me out at the knees and it was a great, 
Could you tell the audience a little bit, just a context about what exactly happened? For the oh, people? there was an audio tape that was released uh, on, you know, TMZ or whatever that, you know, Christian Bale uh, said I was tweaking lights in his eye line, which, you know, I wasn't. And, you know, it was it was a lot of stuff that that led up to this uh, whole thing. It wasn't just this one incident. There was a lot of things that, you know, Christian wasn't happy with on production and, and all that stuff. So, you know, it was, it, and, you know, uh, Keith Ledger had just died and he was having all the stuff with the Batman premieres and going all over and then still coming back to New Mexico. So there was a lot on his plate and it was basically uh, an explosion and the explosion was directed at me. Uh, and you know, I sat there or stood there and, and took it like, uh, a man and I didn't try to, uh, I just diffused the bomb. I, I didn't, uh, react to it. And with that, uh, when that happened, uh, Lydia and I basically sat down and we said, you know what, is this the right thing for our family? Uh, I have two kids uh, I love my wife dearly. We've known each other since we were three years old. Uh, I've already on Terminator Salvation. I was gone 11 months without seeing my family. Was this the trajectory? Uh, looking at all the director photographies that I look up to and inspire to be like are on their fourth marriage and have six and seven kids with different wives. And a lot of them are a just complete shit show. And you know what? I, I I sat there and said, you know what, Lydia, you're right. I, I don't want this. And I want to really kind of um, pivot. And the pivot was her saying, Shane, you are doing such groundbreaking work with this Canon 5D and you're, you know, taking a, a still camera that never, and no one ever thought was ready for prime time and you're blasting it out on 9,000 screens across the country on active valor. Let's share this knowledge. Let's start a revolution of filmmakers that have a voice now that don't require a trustee and a and a uh, uh, a parents fund to fund a movie of three, four, five hundred thousand dollars just to shoot the film, rent the cameras, develop it, process and edit it to put it in a theater. Now they're able to pick up a Canon 5D for twenty five hundred bucks, edit the whole thing in their garage, do the whole movie out, and release it in theaters. So let's. Let's throw gasoline on that flame and let's talk about it. And that was the big pivot. Uh, and I look back at where I am right now and where my headspace is and how I funnel. And it's my wife says uh, that, you know, to us, we've never been more in love. Uh, I've never been more connected with my kids. Uh, I've never been more connected with my parents and her parent, you know, that are all living in our home together right now wow. during the pandemic, right? So you got to understand we have three generations living with us in a family. This is the kind of stuff that usually does not work. Uh, and we've made it work because, you know, I have been able to be much more focused on family and, you know, I, I remember Ke Caleb Dejanel. Everyone thought, where did Caleb Dejanel go? He fell off the planet. He shoot, shot like the natural. And then where was he? Well, he was raising his kids. He wanted to take the time to really focus on his children and make sure they ended up being great human beings and not just the quote unquote set kids that you see that are all screw ups and walk around and, you know, have everything catered to them and all that stuff. I, I kept my kids completely off the set. I didn't want them to have that dream fictitious world. Uh, so we completely pretty much banished them from set life. Uh, we chose to, to have them grounded at home and have friends and go to and become in sports and dance and all that stuff. So they're not just jet setting around wherever I'm going as a cinematographer, they were able to have friends that, 
you know, I look back at my friends that I grew up with uh, in high school and grade school, and they are the friends I have for their whole my whole life. Not the ones I met in college, not the ones I met on the job, but the ones that I met during grade school and high school. So mm -hmm. I wanted my kids to have that foundation and not be just trekked all around from country to country, uh, trying to, you know, going in and out of schools and, and homeschooling and all that stuff. I mean, to each his own. There's a lot of people that have made that very successful, uh, but that was not something that was in my wife and, and my wheelhouse. And thank you so much for sharing. I think sometimes we're so much focused on career success and achievement that we forget about our principles and our values. And next question actually ties uh, very much into this same topic. Anya is uh, posting a question in the live section. Uh, she says, such important productivity lessons. Wow. Shane, how do you balance being productive at work and personal life and life as a whole? given how time consuming your job is how do you balance out yeah and this is something that my wife has been a huge uh proponent on uh you know it's finding this life work balance is very difficult and like i said there's sometimes and that both lydia and i are fail at this uh having me being gone for 11 months on terminator salvation and me just being so in it you know, uh, I did like, I think it was like 38 days straight on that movie without a day off because we, I didn't want, I wanted the second unit cameraman that had signed on. I wanted to go on set with them to make sure they were understanding how I was exposing the film. And so, you know, with digital, it's like you put it up there and you light it and you kind of can match that kind of look and feel, but with film and emulsion, it's, it's, it's organic. It's kind of a, it's magical, right? It's like you're using photons and light meter readings and everything in that organic process. You don't necessarily know what it's going to come up with. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that that person uh, had all my thoughts on how I was going to expose the negative, how I lit stuff. So I didn't go home ever. Uh, I was only in New Mexico. I easily could have gone home for a weekend here and there, but I didn't. And I failed horribly as, as being a dad uh, during this time period. I got sucked into the blockbuster, you know, rat wheel that just sits there and spins and all you can do is, con is be consumed by it. So I thought, well, if I'm able to master prep and I'm able to prepare this movie so well that that communicates it to every department that I can walk in so confident and know exactly what's going to happen every day, then that gives me the time to engage with my soulmate and to reach out to my parents and talk to them. Hey, mom, how was, what do you cook today? And she's like, well, we had the ancient grains, you know, uh, cod today and you know and talk to uh my kids and, and find out you know who they're in love with uh how their day went at school uh i got a c on my paper hey we thought that was going to be an a uh you know kira talking about her acting and how this that the other thing is going so this was once i really started to master the prep i was able to give a lot of focus to the family and keep connected every day. Uh, so how I did it was this, and it's really simple. And it's it's so important to, to do it this way. Okay, what we did is we started a ritual. So Lydia would do the same ritual that I would do every morning. So when I would wake up in the morning, I would go and prepare my coffee. And she would do the same thing. And when the coffee was being made, she would stretch and I would stretch. So we got all our stretching out of the way. Then I would grab my coffee and I would take three or four sips out of it just to get a little energize in me uh, to wake me up. And then we would meditate. Now we're not doing this together in regards to calling up on the phone and all this stuff. We just set the ritual so together we were doing it in conjunction. 
okay? So then after I meditated, I would then look at my phone and see what my day was and uh, look at uh, any emails that came in. And then I would go back and look at my call sheet and I would look at my documents that prepped me for the day and look at my shot list and prepare myself and then go to work. And then when I'd get back from work, we would do the same ritual. Uh, I would come in I would either cook a meal or I would go out to dinner and then I would call Lydia when she was uh, sitting down and having her meal. And then I would talk to my mom. I would talk to her dad. I would talk to her all within this time period. So we were leaving, leading separate lives, but completely in sync with the rituals. And then I would say, you know, what did you meditate on today? And she would share the meditation with me. Oh my God, I just had this meditation. This was incredible. So I'd try it the next morning. And then I was like, oh, this is something I, sh you know, found. Should you try this? So it kept us so close, like we were living together, but, you know, 3,000 miles apart. And that is when it all started to work for us. Uh, and when I started to see my kids completely excited for, you know, talking with me and getting on the phone with me about stuff because we were doing it as a family uh, completely apart, but synergistically together based on rituals. Wow, Shane. Thank you so much for sharing this. I hope you have five, 10 more minutes because I have a couple of questions connected sure. to, to amazing. Um, the questions connected to actually what you and your wonderful uh, wife, Lydia, uh, have been on as a mission, which is which is really education. And, and you guys are so passionate about it. I don't have any data, but I do believe it's, if not the best, one of the top filmmakers, it, academies, uh, that's out there and you guys have been doing it uh, i've been following you from the time when i was a movie producer myself uh and the level of detail the level of education is just exceptional whatever you guys touch is just exceptional i just i just love it but could you well, tell thank me you just why why you're so excited about education and inspiring other people to to become better versions of themselves so you think about um, how do you want to leave this planet, right? What what are your goals? Uh, what what will be your successes? What are your highlights? What are your failures? And you kind of, you know, look at life and you say, okay, uh, am I going to be remembered for you know this film? Uh, am I going to be remembered for uh, this o Academy Award? Uh, those are things, you know. But what about I'm leaving a legacy of educating the future of filmmaking? I think that's something I would much rather uh, be known for than winning an Academy Award or uh, a super famous film that uh, becomes in the top 10 list. Uh, that is the icing on the cake for me. But for many people that are ego and uh you know arrogance driven that is their main mission and that's what they're going for and that's awesome uh you know all power to you but both my parents were educators i was surrounded by it. i was surrounded by coming home from soccer practice and seeing my mom out there correcting all these papers and saying she would say hey hop in you know and and help me and I was like, oh, okay, uh, you know, and seeing, you know, the response and, and how she really would shape and change. And she was a sixth grade school teacher, which is that pivot. That is the direction where people go this way or go that way. And uh, it's, it's that teenage years. It's when, you know, all the hormones are going crazy and everything. And some fall off the tracks and some stay on the path and, and become very successful. So I saw that and I was like, you know what, mom, you're really changing lives. You're setting them on a trajectory to be so successful. I want a part of that. I, I think, and she goes, it's the most rewarding thing uh, I can tell you as being an educator is this one fact that you are changing lives. 
So Lydia, with her brainchild of, of creating, you know, the blog and then Shane's Inner Circle, then the Hurlbut Academy, and now the future uh, Filmmakers Academy, where we are literally expanding our roster to, you know, bringing in so many more instructors of all facets of, of production, post-production, pre-production uh, that are is going to take people beyond film school. It's basically everything you're not taught in film school is what you're going to learn at the Filmmakers Academy. And it doesn't stop at directing and cinematography. We're going to start including production design and producing and color correcting and uh, editorial. Uh, I The future is so bright. Uh, with this uh, format and what we've created and what we've built, uh, that it's it's really inspiring. And and I think that, you know, that's the legacy that I want to leave uh, when when I uh, leave this planet. Uh, I want to be known as the person that really was there for many uh, filmmakers and and chose the the road to success and kind of, uh, funnel them in and sent them down the rabbit holes to be better artists and also show them the life work family balance as well. I mean, Lydia and I are, are going on, you know, 33 years of a successful marriage as well as knowing each other since we were 16 years old. So we got married at 24. So we were you know, eight years on top of that. So 41, 42 plus years of being together, we were able to shape the mate that we wanted to be married to and to fall in love with. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, I love the people that have been with me since I launched the blog uh, because these uh, individuals, I've been able to really mold like a piece of clay and and shape them uh, and and really inspire them um, by by educating at the top at the Hollywood level uh, is what is the secret uh, when you dumb it down and try to make it about popsicle sticks and gaffers tape and and little you know DIY things that's that's one thing that's nice because okay you can really relate at their level but where do they aspire to. Uh, if you're just talking about gaffer's tape and popsicle sticks instead of 18 K's and Cinevators, right? It's like, these are the things that's going to, uh, push them and, and, you know, uh, challenge them out of their comfort zone. I was, uh, yesterday I had this wonderful talk with, uh, my ASC mentee. So I'm part of the ASC mentor program. So we take in 30 or 40 plus mentees and they're assigned to different uh, ASC members. And my uh, Brent, uh, we had coffee yesterday and we just sat down and, you know, it's like, uh, I, I really want to, you know, see how I can successfully navigate these waters. And I go, well, you know, these waters have really changed uh, when I started out, right? The pandemic has really, you know, really flipped the playbook on, on that. But I just said, you know, I go, the biggest lesson that I can share with you is if you are comfortable right now, then you are in the wrong place. You need to push yourself out of your comfort zone. If this is the enclave of filmmakers that you're working with, you need to see that as a foundation, but you need to push yourself out of that zone. I said, get on backstage, see what music videos or something, non-union projects that are happening out and jump on these things and, and donate your time for free and get in with a new group of people, press, you know, push yourself, you know, comfortable is a disaster. That is, that is, you know, that's why I constantly am trying to change the way that I light, change the way that I move camera, uh, change the way that I prep movies. I'm, I'm, and I think that a lot of time director of photographies just don't do the work. Uh, and I don't want to be that DP. I find that if you don't do the work, you're a grumpy DP because you haven't thought it through and you're in fight or flight the whole time. If you think it through, you can be at your absolute best. And with that positivity, it starts with one, with two words. Every single day, I walk on set. 
and I'm going on set and uh, you in the person uh, I walk in and there's the, you know, person at the truck and he says, what would you like today? And uh, I said, you know, I'll take a, you know, egg white burrito. And he goes, how are you doing? And I only have two words that come out of my mouth. Freaking fantastic. And that sets the tone. And you walk in and the electric's like, hey, Shane, how you doing? I'm freaking fantastic. How about you? They're like, oh, my God, this is going to be a great day. Well, every day is the same words. So every day is a great day. And this kind of idea that, you know, leadership skills, lead with positivity, show people you're not this grumpy DP that woke up on the wrong side of the bed that never has enough time to light and never has enough time to do this and always is as a compromise. Well, that's what filmmaking is all about. It's a compromise. So how can you turn that compromise into a positive? And then there's also the being a goldfish. Okay. Goldfishes can't uh, remember 10 minutes Whatever happened 10 minutes ago, they don't remember it. So just be a goldfish as a director of photography. You don't remember. If something failed and it, you know, the focus puller didn't get the focus just right, but we had to move on, or the lighting was just not exactly the way we had planned. Okay, uh, I don't for you know, I don't remember it. Uh, let's just do our best the next time. Uh, and that goldfish mentality is very uh, something that I, I preach uh, to my team. And then the third thing is not everyone is going to get a trophy. Uh, I do not live in the millennial world that uh, just because you showed up and lost uh, that everyone gets a trophy. Uh, I do give out trophies every week to one to camera, one to grip, and one to electric. And all of a sudden, they're like, well, why is Jim winning the trophy three weeks in a row? I go, well, you might want to see what Jim does on set. Why don't you look at what he's doing? Because whatever he's doing, it's awesome. And he's going to continue to get the trophy with a $100 bill on it every week because you're not doing what he's doing. So I start to make it an example. It's like, it's like not everyone gets a trophy just because you show up and have a smile on your face and do your job, that's not going to get you a trophy. But if you whisk in at the last minute and, and fly a light in effortlessly, I am going to, you know, once that shot is done, I'm going to move out onto the, the floor and I'm going to say, I just want everyone to know that John just whipped that light in and it made the actress's face look so, let's give John a round of applause, you know? Or when I walk into the set the first thing in the morning and it's practically lit, I go, I want everyone to give grip, electric, camera, art department, everyone a massive round of applause. Look at what they've done. And these are those moments. And then, you know, by the end of the week, that person or or group of people will get that trophy, you know, and it's and it's and it's fun because. I get these dorky ass, uh, you know, trophies that I get from Amazon. I get 50 of these plastic uh, Oscar trophies for like 10 bucks for 50 of them. And I fan out a uh, hundred dollars worth of twenties in this beautiful, you know, it looks like a, a beautiful peacock, you know, of a flopping the twenties and then I tape it to it and then their name is on it. And, uh, you know, every Monday it's the big trophy award ceremony that's on set and everyone gives everyone a round of applause. This is just great team building. Okay. And it's like taken me a lot of uh, time to understand, uh, how to build a team and how to inspire a team and how to fire them up and and have them do, uh, you know, on the 11th hour, they're still uh, at 180% and giving me their very best. Wow. Shane, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really want to respect your time, even though I have one more question, which is the final kind of a wrap up. No problem. You're fine with it. So the, the last final thing is there's a lot of people listening to the podcast in their 20s trying to find their way in life. What would be your advice to these ambitious young leaders who are trying to find their purpose? I, I would say, you know, one thing that's made me very humble as a director of photography and being humble is in, very important. 
you know, being egotistical and, and all about the ego and just saying that you're the, the greatest thing since sliced bread and all that kind of stuff. There's all bullshit. You know, it's like, you need to be humble as an artist. And I found that starting at the bottom makes you humble. And, you know, it's just like starting out at a restaurant. You start out as a dishwasher and then you move up to this position and move up to that position. I did the same thing. I just was literally packing shelves of a grip truck. And then I moved up to being able to drive it and then being able to run in on set and know all the names of things and then became a dolly grip and then a key grip. So I'm going, I'm moving up the ladder in a way that I respect what they do, I understand how hard it is to move this. You know, I lift those five, you know, 50 foot four out banded cables that weigh like 200 pounds on my shoulder and slop them down and label it. I've been there. So I know what it takes. So, you know, it's, it keeps me humble. And, and, uh, I think that, if you're starting out in your 20s, you want to start right at the bottom. Don't come in thinking you're this director with all this great vision. You know, David Fincher is an amazing director. He started at the bottom and he worked his way up and he knows how to do VFX better than the VFX person. He knows how to do lighting better than the best director, director of photography. This is a guy that knows how every job on set works because he's experienced it. And this is what you need to do to have a long, successful career. You need to start at the bottom, not think that you're going to come out of film school like I did, knocking on doors with my three-piece suit, thinking I'm going to be a producer. That is the wrong mentality, okay? Think about it as you are a loser, Okay, <laughs> and you have to start at the bottom so you can then create your foundation. And once you have that foundation, then you can be launched and you can fly. But having that foundation, that humble nature to know what it takes, you've been in those shoes, you've been, you know, your a director of photography has told you, just lay that cable and lay it now, you know, and you're like, slim and 150 pounds on you and sweating and drips in the desert and you're slinging it out and doing whatever it takes to, to get that vision. I've been in those shoes. I know how hard it is. So when I do ask that of uh, the team, I need to do it in a way that is not condescending and, and belligerent. I need to do it and be like, dude, I know this shit is heavy. I've been there, but uh, we got to get this done and we got to get done fast. So I'll take this end of it, you take that end of it, and I'm going to run like hell to get this cable across the set so we can plug it in so I can get that light, right? So it's, it's I'm constantly, you know, moving stuff and grabbing stuff and, and uh, you know, I'm tactile with all that. So, you know, my advice is start at a rental house. If you want to get into camera, grip, and electric, get into a rental house. Learn how, learn all the terms, learn all the tools, uh, so you can better understand and then learn the classics, watch movies, study, uh, get into film history. You've got to understand what the masters have done before, before you can even uh, start to formulate your mixtape, as I call it, because everything's been done. It's it's how we take a little bit from this person and that person and this person, then put it together in a mixtape that becomes Shane Hurlbut or becomes Bob Richardson or becomes, you know, Martin Scorsese or David Fincher. It's just a, gr a bunch of mixtapes that they're grabbing all these different directors and director photographies and technicians are, they're funneling it all into their mixtape. Shane, I just want to say thank you to you, to Lydia for, for being leaders that are leading by example for, impacting so many young people and not just young people with with your example with your work with with the filmmakers academy soon to be it's just uh, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart on behalf of the team of productivity mastery and um yeah just uh, it's been an honor having you at, uh, at this podcast well, you're so welcome, Stoyan, and thank you so much. I loved your questions. I love where you directed me, uh, where we went. You know, there's a lot of 
lessons that I've learned. And, and uh, I choose to share those, my successes and failures. Uh, and, uh, you know, because I want my members of the Filmmakers Academy and all the artists that follow me on Instagram and Facebook and everything to le lead by example. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do my very best. Yes, there's sometimes when I fail, uh, but uh, I just want uh, everyone to see I'm very transparent with all this. I'm not somebody that holds shit close to their chest. Uh, I want to be transparent. I want to hopefully, uh, you know, veer you away from the uh, eddies in a river or the icebergs that uh, sank the Titanic. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Shane. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for everybody who's been tuning in, listening. Make sure to go check out Herbert Academy, uh, soon to be Filmmakers Academy. Go follow Shane Herbert uh, on Instagram, LinkedIn, or other places. We're going to post the links. Thank you once again, and see you at the next episode. Of All right. Take care. Thank you again, Stoyan. Thank you.